If you're new to the typewriter world, perhaps the name Herman Price is new to you. But if you've been around the typewriter world any length of time, you'll know that Herman Price is a prolific collector of typewriters and has an enormous collection. He lives in West Virginia, and in the last decade or so, he's hosted numerous events, uh, typewriter gathering events, at his property in West Virginia. Well, in the last few years, because of the pandemic, uh, we haven't been able to meet at Herman's, but this year, February 19th, 2022 specifically, we had the second online virtual Herman's gathering of typewriter aficionados from around the world. And I was blessed to have been invited to be a speaker in one of the breakout sessions. Uh, my presentation was on the subject of video production for typewriter people who want to get started in YouTube, for instance, in video production focused on typewriters. And I aimed this presentation mainly at the rank beginner in video production, a person who knows virtually nothing about video. So that's what this video is about. This is a recording made live during my breakout session presentation. I hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned. I suspect the following scenario has happened uh, hundreds of times, perhaps even to some gathering with us today. You come into possession of a typewriter, maybe inherited, and it doesn't work very well. You may be a tinkerer, and you're intrigued with the possibility of fixing, your, fixing it yourself, or maybe you're just interested in knowing more about the machine. So you head to YouTube and type in the name of the typewriter, and the odds are that the results, if you're lucky, lead you either to uh, one, Phoenix Typewriter, which is Dwayne Jensen's fabulous series of clean it and fix it videos, or door number two, Joe Van Cleve, our guest today. Uh, Dwayne is an expert, a magician, and a professional typewriter repairman. His shop in Phoenix, Arizona is on my list of places I must visit, and I've, I'd love to meet him someday. But Joe Van Cleve uh, gives us something quite different on his YouTube channel. He has modeled for us how to be a typewriter explorer. I remember finding his YouTube channel and immediately watching about three dozen videos. Uh, his approach spoke to me. He's warm and inviting. Uh, he started as a, a bit of a novice, a mechanical tinkerer, a fan who wanted to learn and wanted to share his learning. At least that's my impression. And in his videos, he shares his excitement and each find, uh, figures out the workings and the features of each model, and gives us a review of what it's like to actually use it. Uh, on his YouTube channel, he goes beyond typewriter models to discussion of paper, ribbons, anything else that might be useful to those of us who actually use typewriters. Uh, Joe's interests extend far beyond typewriters, though. Uh, he's posted about pinhole cameras, photography, writing, fountain pens, and other gadgets and technologies that help him to be creative. Joe clearly sees the typewriter as an instrument for his own creativity as a writer. He's what uh, he calls a typewritist. Uh, on his blog, he's recently written a piece I recommend for all of us to read called Typewriting Versus Hoarding, uh, in which he passes on some wisdom I know that I could use. I'll end by saying that Joe often reminds us of the importance of community. Uh, he lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's my pleasure to introduce him to our community here today in virtual Hermans. I hope we get to see him in person at Hermans in West Virginia uh, at some point, along with all those other incredible folks in the Southwest and West. Uh, who have made our hobby so much richer. Thank you so much for being here, Joe, and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great being here. And uh, I've been looking forward to this presentation for a while, and it's great meeting all the people virtually and seeing your faces and hearing your voices and everything. So I have, have a presentation here about how to get started in video uh, focused on typewriter videos, but it really works for just about anybody that's a novice in video technology. So I'm going to go share my screen here. So how to get started making typewriter videos. And this is just an overview of the technology. Uh, making video is, is a whole field unto itself. But I just want to kind of answer a lot of the basic questions. If you're a novice in videography and don't know what to do, and you might have some questions about how do I make videos, right? Like maybe you have a question, I want to share my passion about typewriters with others we, using motion and sound, and I don't know how to get started. We'll maybe get you started. The whole technology of video and cameras, microphones, editing software seems confusing. It can be, and hopefully we can steer you straight and give you some starting points. And all that gear and everything sounds expensive. Is there a 
inexpensive way to get into video production? We'll answer that question. What about, this is a big one. If you are a writer, you probably are to some degree, if you're into typewriters, you tell stories through words. What if I don't think I'm visually oriented? Well, I think there's a way we can answer that. And also, how do I get started on YouTube? And I think that's a great avenue for a lot of people to get started on uh, using typewriter videos. But one of the first things you need are tools. And the tools is the gear. So we're going to talk about cameras. There's basically four categories of cameras we can talk about. We're going to talk about microphones. Most likely, you're going to want to use something other than the microphone built onto your camera device. We're going to talk about lighting. It's oh so important because photography uses light. And the more light, the better quality of the picture. And we're going to talk a little bit about editing software. So let's get started with the first category of camera device. Everybody has one in their pocket, probably. It's a phone. You talk and text on it, but you can also use a phone to make video. And most every phone will shoot video. And I personally use an iPhone, but I think you can use an Android phone just as well. But what you really need are a few accessories to make a phone work better for you as a video tool. First of all, some kind of a selfie stick or tripod adapter for your phone so you can mount it to a tripod. Uh, you don't want to just handhold it, especially if you're hold, setting up in front of a table. I really recommend using an external microphone of some kind. We'll talk about those later. And then if you have an older phone, a clip-on lens works really well. Some of the new high-end phones have multiple cameras with different lenses in the back. But these are essential tools for using a phone as a, as a camera for shooting video. Some of the problems or disadvantages of phones is that you have limited memory. Uh, a lot of phones, especially the Apple phones, you can't really plug a memory card in to expand it. Some of the Android phones you can, you, you can put a micro SD card. So you have to manage the file sizes. You don't wanna fill your phone up and video takes up a lot of space. Also, the better quality camera is rear facing and so you can't see yourself on the screen if you're shooting video of yourself. And then thirdly, phones have small sensors so they're gonna not be as good in low light and you won't be able to get that depth of focus, that narrow depth of focus look that you might want. Uh, this is an example of my phone rig that I do use occasionally. This is an older iPhone 6S. I'm using a adapter shoe, an adapter holder that works for just about any kind of phone. It has a cold shoe on top and I plug a microphone into that. The microphone plugs into the side of the phone and the headphone jack. If you have a newer Apple phone, you'll probably need to get the headphone adapter. Um, and then this uh, phone holder has a tripod mount. You can put all kinds of tripods on it. So that's one way, a typical way to get started with video inexpensively. And if you happen to be using an iPhone, it also has iMovie built into it. Your editing software is right there. So the second category of camera is a GoPro or an action camera. You can see the GoPro Hero 7 in my hand there. Um, so there's some pluses and minuses. The plus about an action camera is they're waterproof. Uh, you can literally stick them underwater and they're small. Uh, they have good stabilization, meaning you can walk around with a thing in your hand and it makes the picture look nice and steady. So if you're walking around talking, they're really good, but they have some issues. First of all, they aren't adjustable in focus. The focus is fixed and usually it's fixed out toward infinity. Uh, they have poor battery life you have to carry a couple extra batteries with you uh, if you're going to be shooting for any length of time. And the audio is not great on them. They're really optimized for just action pictures. But some of them, like this one, there's an audio adapter you can plug in so you can use an external microphone. And then a lot of them don't have a screen. You can't see what you're recording. Uh, so this is my GoPro setup. I use it quite a bit. I'm using a little box, a little metal container called a cage that the GoPro fits in. And this cage has a filter thread on the front that I put that close-up adapter lens on. And that enables me to fo a close focus. So it focuses on my face. It has a cold shoe that I can mount a microphone on. And then I use that microphone adapter that 
plugs into the side of the GoPro. So this is a solution to make a GoPro more like a real video camera for doing better quality videos. By the way, if you do use that microphone adapter, it's no longer a waterproof camera because the door is open on the side of the camera. So the third category of video camera that you might have laying around is a camcorder. And by camcorder, I'm not really talking about uh, tape camcorders, but ones that record to a solid state memory card. So the newer camcorders like this Canon are very inexpensive, at, especially the ones that record in 1080p. And there are 4K versions that record in a higher quality format, but they're quite a bit more expensive. Um, Camcorders have great ergonomics. They were the original video camera. They've been around since the early 1980s. They have really good ergonomics. They have unlimited recording time. You can record past 30 minutes per clip. Uh, most other cameras are limited to less than 30 minutes per clip. They have good autofocus. They usually have external microphone jacks and often headphone jacks also. Uh, the disadvantage of a camcorder is the sensor is small, kind of like a cell phone's. And so you can't easily get that narrow depth of focus and the quality of the image is not as good in low light. And they have good telephoto lens. You can really zoom out, but they don't really have wide angle lenses. You have to put an, an adapter on them to get a wide angle shot. Here's an example of the camcorder that I happen to use occasionally. It's a little Canon and you can see it's quite small and the screen flips around and it's very convenient to shoot. The fourth category of camera are generically known as mirrorless digital cameras. And these look like a film camera. They look like a still photography camera, uh, but they shoot video also. And they have interchangeable lenses. This is my main studio camera. Uh, some of these have electronic viewfinders. Some of them have flip out screens that like camcorder style screens. Um, these categories of cameras have the best features and the best lens selection. Interchangeable lenses, image stabilization, a lot of fancy features to make your video look better. They have larger size sensors than cell phones or action cameras. And this gives you the option to have narrow depth of focus and good low light performance and that cinematic look. Uh, some of the third party manufacturers make manual focus lenses for these cameras that are like cinematic cinema lenses. In fact, that's what these, I'm using on this camera in the picture here. A lot of these cameras have external mic jacks and headphone jacks making audio much more convenient. This is your best uh, type of studio camera. It'll do just about everything the best, uh, probably not ideally suited for action. You might wanna use a GoPro, but they're the best camera otherwise. The downside is they're more expensive and you have to buy lenses, which is expensive. There are three different size sensors that you can get in these cameras. And the, the bigger the sensor, the more pricey the camera and the lens. And the bigger the sensor, the heavier the lens. So here is a little diagram explaining the three camera sensor formats that are generally available for video. On the left, you have what we call a full frame sensor. This uses a digital sensor that's the same size as a 35 millimeter film frame. And you can see the common camera brands that use these is the Canon RF mount, Nikon Z, the Panasonic L mount and the Sony E mount. And then you have the medium size sensor cameras, the APS-C, and then you have micro four thirds on the right. Micro four thirds is interesting because Olympus and Panasonic use the same lens mount. So you can interchange Olympus cameras with, uh, and Panasonic cameras with their respective lenses. And I happen to use Panasonic micro four thirds. Um, the size and weight of the lens and the cost usually scales up with the size of the sensor. The bigger the format, the bigger and heavier things are. This is my typical camera, a Panasonic Lumix. This is a GH3, it's an older model. Uh, it has a, uh, this one I'm using a, a kind of a semi shotgun mic on top. The microphone plugs into the side of the camera. These cameras have a flip out screen so you can see yourself recording. And I'm using a little uh, 
f1.8 cinema lens on this camera. Typical the way I use the camera like this. Um, so you have a choice when you're talking about cameras is do you want a phone kind of video image or do you want more of a bigger camera look to it? And the image on the left was taken with an iPhone, but it's respectively representative of the kind of image you will get out of the first three categories, an action camera, a camcorder, or a phone. And it's wide depth of focus. You notice the bookcase behind me is also in focus. Everything's in focus, which can be distracting. You notice the upper right corner, the wall behind my head is in focus. You can see the texture on the wall. Uh, the dynamic range of the image is not as good and it's poor quality in low light. On the right hand image is a picture coming out of one of my Panasonic cameras. And you can see I have narrow depth of focus. I can throw the background out of focus so it's not so distracting. It has better dynamic range, better quality image in low light because it's a bigger sensor. So this is why I always recommend using this kind of camera for your main studio camera. So microphones, audio is very important with video. And I would say I'm, I'm breaking up the microphone category into kind of two, two categories. Studio microphones, the kind of microphones you're gonna leave in place in your desk or table, wherever you shoot video at. You can have the kind of microphone that is not visible on camera. This is what I use. I use a condenser microphone just above the picture, above my head with a preamp, but you can also use these directional mics called shotgun mics. Um, the other style of microphone is put it on your desk and you can look like Johnny Carson. Have a nice microphone right there, everybody can see. And then for mobile use, you're out like in your workshop, shooting pictures of typewriters, repairing them, and you need a kind of a mobile audio solution. You can use a lavalier mic, and that's in fact what I'm using today for the presentation, clipped on my shirt. Uh, but you can also use wireless microphones. There are really good wireless microphones these days that are relatively inexpensive. So here's a, a, an example of three different kinds of microphones that I use on the left is my studio mic that is just above my head right now. It's a dynamic vo vocal microphone and it needs a preamp. So I use this little battery powered preamp that can attach to my camera. On the middle is my lavalier mic. I, I have a couple of these that are really nice. They plug into the camera, clip them onto your shirt or anywhere conveniently close to your mouth. And then the third category are the wireless. This is the Rode Wireless Go. You plug the transmitter in, onto the top of your camera, plug it into the, uh, uh, the receiver, I mean, on the camera, plug the cable into your camera, and then the transmitter fits onto your shirt as its own microphone. And those are very handy for recording uh, video and audio out and about. Uh, along with a good microphone setup, though, you need some sound dampening, especially if you're sitting in front of a hard surface like a a table surface, you get these kind of echoey room noises. You don't need to spend a lot of money on fancy soundproofing. You can buy, save up those egg crates, use a, a, a thick bath towel, or go to the craft store and buy sheets of foam rubber. There's all kinds of ways to do it yourself in sound dampening so your, your setup sounds a little better. And then lighting is very important. So you have your studio set up, you have your camera, uh, you have to decide on how to light it. The more light, the better quality of the picture. You can use natural window light, but it's not reliable. It varies between cloudy and, and the clear skies, and it's only available in the daytime. So you really do need studio lighting. There are a lot of commercially made options uh, nowadays. Lighting is more Prevalent, prevalent now than ever before. You have all kinds of LED lights and diffusers and lighting stands. You can also do it yourself, which I'll show you one option. And then there are mobile types of lighting. If you're out on your workshop showing a typewriter, you want some kind of light on the machine. You want a, a mobile solution. There are these battery powered light panels. I'll show you one example here in a minute. And there's also something as simple as a flashlight. If you're trying to zoom in to the guts of a typewriter, a, a good flashlight works great for that. So homemade reflector lights. This is what I'm using right now on my studio. $8 hardware store clamp lights with daylight balanced LED bulbs. 
And I'm using a sheet of vellum drafting paper with bulldog clips to cover the front of the clamp light and make a diffused light source. I use four of these on my table. And it's a really simple $15 solution for lighting. You don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, for portable lighting, I like these battery powered LED lights. This particular one is a Viltrox. It has a tripod mount. You can attach it to a tabletop tripod to make it conveniently to locate next to your typewriter. This one has an adjustable output power and adjustable color temperature. It's powered by a large camcorder battery, so you can move it around, not have to plug it into the wall. These are great solutions for lighting. You should get a couple of these if you're gonna be doing video. Okay, editing software. So if you wanna get really serious about video, you're probably gonna to wanna to use Adobe Premiere. The software is the professional solution, but it is a steep learning curve. It is not intuitive for the newcomer and it requires a powerful computer. And you probably won't use all of its capability. There are newer uh, types of editing software. One example is DaVinci Resolve. It's really used for color grading or adjusting the colors on your video after you've shot it. I tend to argue though, that for the rank beginner of video, the first principle is that good storytelling comes before flashy special effects. So you don't necessarily need Adobe Premiere right away. And as far as color grading your footage, the first principle is learn to expose the picture in the camera properly using the proper film mode on the camera, the proper exposure and white balance and the proper lighting. That's always the best. It's always best to start out with good footage. And for that reason, I recommend if you happen to have an Apple computer or an iPhone or an iPad, pad, you have access to iMovie. It's one of the best, uh, most intuitive, easy to use editing solutions. And you can also get a version available for Windows. I happen to use iMovie for all my videos and it meets my needs. And it's very low uh, intensity on the computer itself. So speaking of intensity of, of computing resources, you're going to want to learn how to manage your computer uh, in terms of the horsepower of the computer because video is very taxing on the computer's performance. So it's compute, in it's compute intensive, as they say. And the choice of editing software can make a huge difference, as can uh, the size of the video files. So the more performance that your computer needs to have, the more money you're going to end up spending. And you have to decide now if you're going to be shooting mostly 1080p video or 4K footage. A lot of the new cameras are available in 4K. It's a better quality format, but it takes up four times the space on your computer and it takes longer to upload and edit. So that's something to think about. And also, I always recommend never store your footage on your main hard drive where your operating system is because that will slow down your operating system. So I always store my footage on an external drive. This minimizes the amount of load on your main operating system. Whenever I render or create the final video from a project, I render it to an external drive and any of the library files that I'm saving for future projects also get stored externally. So I don't clog up my computer. It's something you need to think about with video. And also some people have the tendency to want to save every second of footage that they've ever shot in their life. And the question really is how much hard drive money do you want to spend? How many hard drives do you want to buy? I only save the footage that I think I'm gonna be using in the future. So here are some production tips that I have for you. If you wanna get started in, in video, some things to make it go well. A lot of my videos start and end with a talking head shot. I'm sitting in front of the camera in the studio talking to people. What I usually do is I shoot all the talking head scenes at once. The beginning one, the middle and the end ones. And the reason why is for consistency. 
So you can shoot the scenes out of order to the final story. That's the beauty of editing. You don't have to shoot it in the same order that you're going to present it. And as I'm shooting it, as I'm actually talking in front of the camera, I, pa I listen to myself talk. And if I make any blunder or mistake, I simply stop, give myself two or three seconds, and I restate it. And I can edit that out. And, and it makes it really easy that way. So I rehearse on camera. Because the first time you start talking about something, you're not going to be very good at it. I make multiple takes of the same subject and I listen, play back, listen to them and I redo them, reshoot them as I go. And then I decide eventually I have a good version of that clip. I'll keep it. And here's another tip. Minimize those ums and ahs and does, you know, the way we talk uh, to each other. Edit those out. Try to minimize the number of them that you, you say and don't mumble but modulate your voice, keeping in mind video is public speaking. So don't drone on and on, don't speak too slowly. You have to respect the viewer's time. And look at the camera lens, not at the screen on the side of the camera. People can tell when you're not actually looking at the camera lens. And then think about framing. How much headroom is there above your head? Is there any distracting backgrounds? Is your exposure good? Do you have good lighting, right? And then finally, consider your microphone. Consider the quality of your audio. Maybe you have a noisy house. Maybe the neighbor next to you is mowing his lawn. Uh, you know, so think about audio. Get the microphone good and close to you. So the next thing to think about in terms of production is, are you going to use a script? So if you find it necessary to use a script, you can use an electronic device like a phone or a tablet, or you can use paper. Generally, you want to place it in front of and just below the camera lens. The problem is if you're reading the script live on camera, people can tell you're not looking at the camera lens and they can tell you're reading from the script. You want to speak it in your normal voice and cadence. You want to make it sound conversational and don't look at the script as you're, as you're speaking it. And for this reason, I personally don't use scripts. I have a series of talking points that I thought about, and I kind of mentally talk from those instead of using a script, but it depends on how you want to do it. The next point is about B-roll. This is a filmmaking term. The main footage you've shot on your camera is like the A-roll. Then you have these little side clips, these transitional clips. I use oftentimes to cover up maybe an awkward transition between two scenes or just a transition between one part of the video and another. And these are, you know, oftentimes like a close up panning shot of a typewriter or close up of the typewriter in action, a side view of me typing on the typewriter. And I save these B roll shots in my software library for future use. And so it's always fun to find inventive camera angles and new ideas and new scenes to make as B-roll. Even I've typed out in the desert, right? In one of my older videos, it's kind of fun to find new venues for B-roll. And then uh, making mistakes. So I've seen a lot of YouTubers do this. They post a video. There's a mistake in the middle of the video and they mention the mistake and they apologize for it. It's better just to reshoot the video. Uh, this is not, we're not shooting film. We're shooting video. The memory is almost free. You can just erase over a memory card and reshoot it. Um, the viewer doesn't want to watch you fumble and make mistakes and then apologize after because their time is worth too much, right? So just, if you make a mistake as you're talking, just stop, take a deep breath, wait two or three seconds, and then re-speak and redo it. And you can edit that out afterwards, right? So those are kind of some basic tips for production of shooting the video. Now let's talk about editing, right? First of all, transferring your footage from your camera to your computer, use a cable or a card reader. Don't do it wirelessly. Even though some of these cameras offer that capability, it's just a lot slower. The second thing is about the soundtrack or the audio on your video. I always edit my videos with a soundtrack visible uh, because I can see the, the gaps between when I'm talking and when I take a pause. I can see the ums and the ahs. I can edit those out just by looking at the soundtrack. And you need to adjust the volume and the sound quality between the clips so they all sound consistent. 
You want to have a consistent sound, no harsh transitions from one clip to the next. And if you use any kind of background music, make sure it's not too loud. You don't want it to overwhelm your speaking. And does the finished soundtrack play like a good radio program? Close your eyes and listen to it. It should be good on its own. So transitions in the video itself from one clip to the next, I oftentimes use dissolve transitions, especially if I have to cut out ums and ahs in my speaking, then I have to do a little dissolve transition to smooth it out, or I put some B-roll on top of it that's too jarring. You can also do this other transition called a J-cut, which is where the audio of the next clip starts a little bit before the previous clip ends, and it helps to smooth out the transition. Those are easy to do. And you should also adjust the video so that all the clips are the same, they have the same look to them, the same brightness and color. And then also you might need to shoot additional footage while you're halfway through the edit. You might decide, I need to do another shot. I forgot to mention something. So it's always a good idea to leave the set in place, leave your same shirt or clothes on so you look consistently the same. Okay. So here's the thing about shooting video, making film, is the power of montage. So you have the brain, you have distinct video clips. And when you put those video clips into a time-ordered sequence, when one of them comes after the other in time, your brain automatically creates a story. And this is biological. It is hardwired into our genetics. When you put one clip after another, we will try to make a story out of it. And that's the power of montage. The viewer actually assembles the finished movie in their mind. So keep that in mind. Now, if you're interested in, if you think you're a writer, but you don't think you can do storytelling with pictures, let's go through the process real quick. Here's your brain. And you have ideas, you have wonderful character ideas, maybe based on people you've met in real life. You have events and stories and places you like to put those into. And then you actually end up with words and passages in your, in your head, and you want to do something with that. As a writer, you write them down. And eventually, you create books and stories in, in printed form. But you can also take those words in your head and show the words and speak the words. So moving images and audio, uh, spoken sound, can create video. So what I'm implying here is that it's, it comes from the same origin as writing does, the creation of the video. It's... It's really the words in your head. It's the story in your head. You're just using a different craft to tell the same stories. So video is storytelling through the means of pictures and sound, right? So now some final thoughts. So always make sure the story comes first. You know, you can get into special effects and fancy graphics, but too much flash overwhelms the story. Secondly, audio is very important. And keep in mind, if you're using YouTube, you don't want to have uh, copyright infringements. So if you want music in your, uh, in your videos, you want to either use YouTube's free audio library or a paid music subscription service. And don't forget, audio is more than 50% of the art of video. You can think of a video as a slideshow with good audio or an illustrated radio production. Audio is very important. Third point is trim your video down. Cut it, cut it, cut it down. I do this all the time. I find myself restating what I've said before in a different form. And I end up cutting the repetitive stuff out. It's redundant all over again. Uh, don't be afraid to reshoot a scene to make it better. And if you have any doubt about it, reshoot it. Because it could be online forever, right? And then before you render and upload your video, watch it. Watch the whole production from start to finish, full screen. 
stop immediately and fix it if anything seems the slight bit wrong. Just and then go back and repeat it, play back again until it's good. That's the process I use. Um, and then think about if you do post a video to YouTube, you're going to need a thumbnail image. So you can either use a screen grab from your video or you can shoot a photo. Just think about that as part of what you need to do. And then finally, when you're rendering and uploading your video, go off and do something else. Go get a cup of tea, go type, read a letter or whatever. There's two more foils to the pr presentation. And one of them is how to get started in YouTube and open a, start get a Google account and open a YouTube account. Simple as that. Decide on the name of your channel. Decide if you want more than one channel. Are you, like I have one channel with every kind of subject matter in it. Some people use separate channels. Um, and then start uploading videos. It's most important to just start making videos. The more, the better, the more regularly frequent, the better, and the shorter initially, the better. Use simple titles and graphics so that you can People can search on your videos and find them. And then make your video channel a community. Engage the comments, engage the viewers. When can you monetize your channel? Well, you have to have more than 1,000 subscribers and more than 3,000 viewing hours. And then you apply for monetization. When I applied for it, it took them six months to get around to, a, to authorizing me. Uh, you get paid through AdSense and Google Payments uh, into a direct deposit to your bank account. The income is taxable, you get a 1099 form. The most important thing is have fun, do good work, and it'll work out for you. Be original, find your own voice. You can be inspired by other creators, don't copy them. Don't use clickbait titles, mainly because it's harder to search for the content later on with a clickbait title. Um, also be aware of copyright infringement, any sound, any music that's copyrighted, they will automatically detect on your video and they will flag you for a copyright infringement. And also, YouTube is a television network. They own it, you don't. They put advertising on it. You have some limited say in what kind of advertising, but it's their channel. Keep that in mind. Okay, I am done with my presentation. I'd love to entertain some of your questions. We have a few minutes. So Andrew, if you don't want to speak, uh, your question is, uh, how much time does it take for you to upload your videos? Oh, uh, great question. So um, when I had DSL, <laughs> it took me, let's say a, a long video, like a 20 minute video would take me a couple hours. Um, I just got Comcast cable, the fastest internet speed they would give me. And I uploaded a 24 minute video last week in five minutes. So it depends on the speed of your, of your internet, internet signal. Um, and for me, around these parts, uh, cable modem seems to be the most optimal uh, type of internet signal. Uh, what is your ideal studio setup if money was no option? That's Gregory Short. Yeah, if, if money was no option, I would not have my studio in my house. I would have it in some other place I could go to. And there wouldn't be the interruptions of domestic life. You know, I have a small house, that hardwood floors on a crawl space. Everything is noisy. The whole house echoes. So, you know, if someone is playing a TV in the other room or something and talking too loud, I can pick it up on the microphone. So it would be nice to ideally have a place already set up. But that's, you know, a dream, right? <laughs> we have to kind of make do with where we're at. I started in, in, uh, in shooting in my garage, actually. Quite a slurry of ones here. We got, uh, how long did it take you to perfect your technique and become comfortable? That's Lynn. You seem so comfortable in all your videos. You know, that's, that's an interesting question. I think it comes from rehearsing. Uh, sometimes I'll lay in bed and I will think of a video and I will have a minute. I'll, I'll lay in bed and I'll, I'll go through the whole video in my mind. And so that when I start shooting it the next morning, I don't need a script. I sort of have these talking points already in my mind. We have less than one minute accordingly. I thought they were going to give us a five minute warning, but they didn't. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be kicked out in a second. Yep. Um, last uh, question. What's your favorite video in, uh, that you've done? Well, let's see. I, I can't remember the I can't remember the name of it, but the one about um, the ones that are more philosophical about typewriters and their usage are my favorite ones. Where I'm sort of walking around talking about creativity in general. Those are the ones I really like. 
So during this presentation, I tried to limit the discussion of equipment uh, to be very generic in terms of the categories and kinds of equipment because um, there's always new gear coming out every few months so it's really not uh, wise to be specifying particular camera brands and models for instance for somebody that's going to watch this video two or three years down the road or even six months down the road things change so the purpose of this video is more about general orientation for the rank beginner in video production. What kind of gear do you need? How do you go about starting a video edit? What are the things you need to think about to start a YouTube channel, etc.? Again, a rank beginner orientation video. But I hope that out there, there are a lot of you that who have been watching typewriter videos and are really curious about maybe starting your own channel. You have your own ideas you think you'd like to express, and I encourage you. Get out there, even if it's just using your phone to begin with, get out there, start a YouTube channel, start putting out content, drop a note down below if you do. I'd love to share your channel with other people. Good luck and stay creative and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.